Okay, so I believe that we have a connection already opened and we can start the uh, session on the multi-stakeholder expert group plenary. Um, we're going to have uh, a session in which we hope that the experts will participate by sharing their experiences, suggesting improvements to how we work together, and that they do so, not just people present in the room, but also those who are connecting online. Um, and we will start the session by uh, watching an address by the former chair of the Meg Baroness, Joanna Shields, who unfortunately she wasn't able to be here in person or connect directly online live, but she has recorded this message. And if you could please go ahead and play it. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Global Partnership on AI 2022 Summit. I wish I could be together with you in Tokyo for what I'm sure will be a meeting of brilliant minds, but I am with you in spirit today and in solidarity of our common goal to promote and support the responsible development and deployment of AI. This week, I end two marvelous years as the co-chair of the steering committee and leading the multi-stakeholder experts group plenary. It's been an incredible experience and a privilege but before I pass the torch on to our capable hands of our new MEG chair, Inma Martinez, I wish to share a few words about the importance of GPAY's mission at this moment in time and for our collective future. We have come a long way since Prime Minister Trudeau and President Macron established GPAY during the 2018 and 2019 G7 presidencies. I remember back to the first summit in Montreal in December 2020 when our world was gripped in a global pandemic. At that time, our partnership came together to provide a sense of direction, purpose, and most of all, hope for the future of AI. Since then, we've grown to 25 member countries, united in a mission to support and promote responsible AI development and adoption, as well as collaboration on AI, guided by the OECD principles of human rights, democracy, inclusion, diversity, and sustainability. We have all witnessed GPAY grow into the strong and well-rooted organization it is today, and it's been a true honor. Never before have I engaged with such a passionate, committed group of scientists and technologists, driven by the desire for better outcomes for, and for AI to be fair and equitable for all. I want to use this opportunity to pay tribute to those who have contributed their time expertise and commitment. And on behalf of GPAY, we are truly grateful to all of you. Last November, I had the opportunity to present the first Meg Plenary report to President Macron at the Paris Peace Forum. And I'm delighted to share the great progress our working groups have made this year in the 2022 Meg Annual Report. The Meg Annual Report is becoming a seminal publication for shaping our collective AI-enabled future and a touchstone for all parties involved in its development and adoption. Through this vehicle and the work it represents, GPAY is gaining stature as an organization and growing closer to becoming a global mover in shaping policies around artificial intelligence. Whilst AI is driving world-changing innovation, it is up to us to prevent it from being used to undermine our core principles of freedom, human rights, and equality. I believe GPAY can now be even bolder in its quest to be a true global convener of AI debates and to help inform and shape policies that will liberate and propagate AI as a force for good in society. As we open this third MEG plenary session, I want to recognize the importance of coming together and the value of our summits, which are a testament to the strength of the multi-stakeholder engagement towards our common goals. From the inaugural summit in Montreal in 2020 to taking stock of our progress in Paris in 2021 and determine, determining how to be a beacon of light in this digital age, as President Macron said, and to now here we are in Tokyo, we have shown that our humanity can speak with one voice on artificial intelligence. 
our values of collaboration, dialogue and agreement on common standards are more important now than ever. While we may, be in, may no longer be in the grip of the COVID-19 pandemic as we were during our launch, we find ourselves in times of uncertainty with geopolitical tensions rising and economic turbulence. Amid the current climate of economic and political turmoil, AI systems are being funded and developed without appropriate infrastructure to, to promote their responsible use. Moreover, we are seeing AI and machine learning technologies being wielded by malevolent actors to cause deliberate harm, for example, in disinformation campaigns around the Ukraine war and recent elections in other countries. Governments and businesses must work together to take forward GPA's recommendations of the past two years and in this MEG report, if we are to steer the development of AI globally in a positive direction. We have built a strong foundation on which we can expand, once more embracing the spirit of collaboration by bringing more voices into debates and discussions on AI and by engaging more actively with the Global South. I see incredible strength and potential when I look at our organization and what we have built. With world-leading expertise in AI and members from across the globe, we can change the course of future of humanity for the better. To do this, we need to recognize and empower experts, and the MEG report is an excellent foundation. Ultimately, GPA's work must translate into actions that can be taken forward by government, industry, and stakeholders. This begins with building on our progress and with members and experts collaborating closely to make recommendations in the report a reality. We need to better empower our experts and enable them to contribute on a higher level to achieve more significant impact as we go forward. We need to trust them, listen to them, and let their knowledge and expertise guide us. So let's take the opportunity of this summit to do just that. I wish you all an excellent experience in Tokyo and also virtually, and I look forward to seeing what comes out of your meetings and interactions over the next few days. The work of the Global Partnership on AI and our community matters more now than ever. Let's prove we are up to the challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, um, for your committed service to the expert group during its most critical founding stages. You've done it with grace and dedication, and for that we shall be indebted to your contribution. Honorable members of Japan's government and GPI delegation, GPI observers, esteemed GPI experts and specialists, invited guests, welcome to the 22 multi-stakeholder expert group plenary. Thank you for attending in person in Tokyo I'm most grateful to those who are connecting from different time zones. When most of the experts accepted the GPA mandate, the expert group was envisioned as a collective force where experts from science, industry, civil society, trade unions, international organizations and governments would reveal and address the challenges that member countries and the world as a global community faced when developing AI and delivering AI-driven technologies. The excellence of the work delivered by the MEG is outstanding, especially because it has been put together by a singular community of experts and specialists. There is no such combined human capital anywhere in this world. And I speak as someone who joined as a member nominated expert in 2021 with 20 years of AI and technological development in my remit and almost equal amount of time of advisory to both public and private sectors. The MEG is an invaluable asset that has only gotten started. The MEG was conceived as a working arm a scientific community putting their skills and expertise at the service of nations so that AI can really be deployed in the world as a force for good, economic progress, and social welfare. 
In these initial two years, 2020 and 2021, the GPA Experts Group has worked under incredibly tough conditions, first in the middle of a global pandemic, and in its second year, having to deal with the exponential rise of AI in the world because of the very same pandemic and its disruptive effects in society are emerging some of the biggest challenges today. Healthcare, agriculture, manufacturing, and many other industries have all entered an accelerated digitization roadmap driven by AI and other emerging tech because of this. Governments have all raised the level of e-government services deployed to citizens because the world of paper forms and queuing up at government agencies was shut down during the pandemic. Society's datification, the need to know, is now a major driver of AI adoption. And what this means is that the interest of the members on AI has now become requirements, real needs to address economic and societal challenges where AI can come in and solve them. And the most effective way for the MEC to deliver value is to respond to this call with our expertise. From the MEC's perspective, we can all testify from our individual and collective experiences as AI experts that AI in 2022 is not the AI of 2018 and 19, when the GPA was envisioned. We witness now a transformative technology that cannot be contained within just research and academia because the very nature of AI is one of creating value in the world, solving real tasks, optimizing all processes, reducing errors, predicting outcomes. AI is a tool, an empowering force for progress. So at this crossroads, the original ethos of this community, of this international organization of becoming a multi-stakeholder initiative aiming to bridge the gap between theory and practice on AI has shifted the originally assumed dynamics that the working projects would come from the experts and ripple upwards to the members as food for thought and consideration. Projects to be funded by the GPA members for their strategic value. In 2022, the MEC projects need to be funded for their actionable value, for their clear path to execution and adoption because this time is of the essence because it is now or never that we set the course of AI towards its true beneficial potential. The GPA was also conceived as a multi-stakeholder organization supporting cutting-edge research and applying activities on AI-related priorities. In this third year, we shall deploy a coordinated approach where the experts will continue to audit the state of AI and to provide compounded strategic recommendations on the various fronts where AI is manifested in the world or where AI could be deployed as a solution. But we shall develop projects that the members can align to their needs for economic and social welfare. We shall work towards an applied AI and AI that deliver this progress. Because progress today is about creating value. It's about solving real issues, advancing humanity towards a future where we ensure not only our survival, but the quality of our lives. And the aim is to forge a symbiotic relationship between the MEG and the members, acting as a community supportive of each other's needs. Governments need economic progress and social welfare. AI practitioners, AI-driven industries, AI policy makers need governments to support their work with sound regulation, investment in activities that will make AI flourish and achieve its purpose and promise of ethical, benevolent, innovative AI. Because the 21st century digital civilization must be the most ethical 
the most aware of the need to create sustainable practices because the problems of our future can no longer be solved with 20th century business models, institutions, and regulatory environments, and 19th century mindsets. This is why the GPA is important, and this is why we are here. The second implementation to adjust to our growth as an international member organization is that the value of the MEC resides in the collaborative connections of these experts and specialists. To address the departure of some of our experts at the end of their mandates, or specialists finishing their engagements at the conclusion of projects, the MEG will nurture a wider network of former experts and specialists still connected to the group's endeavors, an alumni network of some sort that will contain current and past experts and specialists who at key moments will still have open channels to continue collaborating with our work if they wish to do so. The value of a network resides in the connections of its nodes. We know that. So we shall ensure that the growth of the MEG, the human capital, does not diminish and continues to contribute to the shared values and the purpose of the GPA. And what is the GPA that we aim for from a MEG's perspective? Well, the space industry is a good example. And today is no longer about scientific missions to probe the universe or geopolitical iron curtains. It is a collaborative scientific and commercial community supported by governments that is creating a cislunar economy ensuring that Earth, and not just the galaxy, benefits from its scientific research, and humanity from its applied technologies in healthcare, new sources of energy, transport, telecommunications, precision agriculture, additive printers, and many others. This is an exemplary template for the GPA because AI, this mysterious technology of endless possibilities that we work on and study, is exactly the same as the cosmos. We started to teach machines how to think 50 years ago, how to use computational force brute to deliver tasks, how to use creativity to resolve new horizons for the sciences like AlphaFold. But where AI will achieve its true splendor will be when it is a clear force for progress and the advancement of humanity for the developed nations, but most importantly, for the countries in development. And that can only happen when we see it in action, in business and society. Let us rise to the occasion in which we experts and specialists have been given the floor at a time when we can build the AI that we see fit for the world to inherit. Let us work towards this goal and deliver from the MEG to the GPA this manifested vision. I am grateful for your support of my nomination in electing me to this chair position. I am here to support your work, our work, and to ensure that Japan's mission, where we deliver not just unique skills and expertise, but we deliver what the MEG touches the ground, the people, we deliver to humanity, we inspire and incentivize members to deploy the GPA's mission. Let us use this plenary to discuss how we can work towards this goal and how to strengthen our expert groups and activities for the highest benefit of everyone concerned. Hontani arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to my very esteemed colleague, Dr. Yuko Harayama, Professor Emeritus at the Graduate School of Engineering in Tohoku University in Japan. Thank you, Ima. Call me Yuko, it's much easier. And I call you Ima, because we are between us as experts of GPI and the collaborating since June 2020, 
already almost three, three years. Um, I'm charged today in this session to present the very first MEG annual report. But before starting really going on the contents, just shortly I'd like to describe who we are, MEG, and why this MEG annual report. Um, in 2020, Tokyo Summit, I'm very happy to have all of you in Tokyo. I'm located in Tokyo, so I feel comfortable with that. Um, our history of MEG, or our history of GPAY, started in June 2020. Um, within this big framework, GPAY, we studied actions, not only as a big institutional framework, but much pragmatic, practical issues. I have to check. This one. Um, starting with the ideas making work at the working group levels, more decentralized way. So I was co-chair of working group Future Work and uh, we didn't know in which direction we have to go and then how we have to work. But really, in the spirit of a startup company, many ideas, many things to do. We, the floor is open to you, and, but we will have huge responsibility to discuss about the key issues. And then, uh, I recognize that being a part member of working group means we are within the multi-stakeholder expert group. I did not the beginning, but uh, just having a look on the term of references, I recognize I'm a member of the bank. So what's MEG? What's MEG? It's started as a gathering of working group expert. All together, it makes multi-stakeholders expert group. But uh, for me, it was quite difficult to think about what, what's in today's it. And um, at the beginning, the first year, Monreal Summit, it was online. We had many plenary sessions. Last year, in Paris, we have MEG Summit, uh, I'm sorry, GP Summits, and within MEG plenary session face to face. Um, but something happening just once a year. So difficult to see as I, I, I'm a member of MEG or not in between. So the question is really uh, think about the ownership by expert of MEG as an entity. Um, time that we have make plenary and uh, the question is how to make multi stakeholder expert group as an entity that means we have to work together beyond existing working group structures then we need to have exchanging ideas about the future work and concretely future work plan for the next years. And then now we have this MEG annual report. Now from the beginning already two years and a half, third time, and for the first time this year we have MEG annual report. Something new comer that hopefully we will continue to work each year to become some annual events and really to be worked. First version. And uh, for the first version, again, it was kind of startup companies split. There's no organized plan. We said among experts, we need absolutely to have this annual report to make sure that we are something in an entity to express our voice, compacting, but putting 
several ideas together to make sure that we have something in common, working together. This is our annual report, the first versions. Um, I, I would say uh, we need to not just from expressing our voices, but our voice to be listen and also feedback and go on forth with our members, GPI members. So as mentioned by Emma, we need to have very clearly partnership with members and make to work together in view of advancing AI in society in a better way. So, uh, more concretely, it was quite difficult to see how we can interact with Meg, Meg and members because there's no formal space, regular space for discussing together. Because as I said, experts uh, within working group, we are working within and now it's a Meg level, we are working together. Now it's time to have interaction more informally, but the formally between members and experts. So today, till now, uh, we had a space called steering committee where we used to work together, members, representative, and also uh, MEGS representative working together. But this was very more governance issues, not on the substance. So we need to have something more on the substance dis discussion between members and MEG members. So it should be something that we have to innovate. And then but still, again, we have to have this kind of startup company spirit to be creative. So now I'm just arriving to the MEG and your reports. Uh, this is something like a showcase, catalog of actions. And hopefully uh, having a look on the annual reports from MEG members from the AI expert perspectives is something that you can take home in your work, in your organization, and also for members also is something that you can take home uh, when you have discussed in your country, your strategy on AI or digitization of your system. And yeah, I read in the MEG and report something interesting that you can pick up and it's for free. You can use as you want. Also, I think this annual report could be used as a materials for dialogue and for collaboration to start with between members and between AI community of experts. As mentioned by Ima, it's incredible to have all the these people together and we can, we can't find anywhere else than all these, not only in terms of expertise, but uh, in terms of how you're working with AI and uh, in terms of global dimension. We are growing with the member countries. And then we have also experts coming from non-member countries. It's really a large amount of expertise. Uh, and also we hope that this annual report may nurture government's actions, not recommending and not just forcing them, but we can keep them and then uh, based on this annual report's contents, you can be inspired by and you can customize in your country's context and social cultural context, but it could be something that to, to nurture government actions. I would say kind of some uh, keywords will be united. United across the members of MEG, beyond your working party, working group, and united between members and experts, united across global arrangements. And also we are keen about 
our status, multi-disciplinary, uh, multi-sector, multinational, or the multi. And also, we are very keen about not only discussing theoretically, but much more practical actions mentioned by Inma. Uh, it is not academic society. It is not just providing papers and so on, but something actionable on the ground. So more oriented to the practice. And also more concretely, more really operationally, uh, the report we have just, I'll be presenting on the conference now, uh, it may help to make prioritization of the future planning of GPA work. So concretely, 2023, we have to have a series list of project by each uh, working group. And it's something that we can look at this annual report to see what could be the orientation. So this is may concrete actions. Uh, as I say, May report is really um, a tool facilitating dialogue between members and experts. So let's move on. Um, as I say, a tool to communication, to communicate the work and progress of GPI, because we have some a chapter on reporting what each working group has been done and what's the perspective for the futures. And also, it's a way to shape uh, priorities, align GPI's effort. It's not only working group each individually, but the idea for the next year challenges, we have something common ground. And then to have a cross-cutting issue that we have to work together, so align GPS efforts. And also a document to show expert work in one consolidated view. So there are many ideas within, but you can just have this report to have a novel view. Um, as I say, so many work delivered and also made so many impact, potential impact. Uh, and also the challenge would be really uh, how to come to the global AI dialogue because we are not only within GPI. It is something that we are setting our product to outside. Each of you as an expert in AI, you have your own affiliations. You have many institutions, many fora related to AI. And then for this, you can bring this annual report to compare what your practice in your institution, in your fora, and then nurturing your debate, and then please coming back to GPI to really better shape ideas and nurturing GPI's work, this is. And uh, also, we are within this global challenges world. And already mentioned by Ima, many things that we have to solve. And here, you can use AI. You can really drive AI in this way that to gather all UN sustainable development goals would be something that we have to focus on and that we are already working on. So how it's contributed to the United Nations Sustainable Goal. Um, this is really first way, first version. So for this first version, we have really quickly setting up editorial board, thanks to initiative coming from Nicola Mia Lee, uh, he was really a promoter, really a driver of setting up this editorial board and to make sure that we have today this May report. No, when you are enter just taking something new, you need to have someone driving force. And uh, Nicola was there, and uh, we have been working together, and then it's happened that we have been successful as a startup company to make this report in time to show to you today. Um, 
so, and also, uh, the second one, it's something that you can use as a setting up strategic priority for GPIS work. So you have some reporting activities, but future oriented. So among these ideas, you can say, okay, next year, 2023, we'll be focusing on summer year. And also we have kind of, we, we gently say, four recommendation to the member. Uh, it is not exactly what we mean by policy recommendations. It is in the partnership, we like to express our view to help governments, to support governments, to nurture sub government. These are the ideas that we have discussing and very fine tuning these ideas. So this is up to you to pick up some of them or giving us the feedback. So finally, I would say it is kind of invitation to GPI members. They may consider which projects under 2023 work plan uh, they would like to adopt, and also by joining the respective project steering group and supporting the scaling up and implementation phase. So we are not only just launching projects. Launching does means you are working on and also you are thinking about the implementation. And as mentioned by Ina, you should be more, more than more action oriented and uh, challenge oriented and also to serve society, to serve the world challenges. So let's move on the substance. Uh, I hope all of you, you have access to the annual report. So please have a look in detail and we welcome your reaction, your feedback, because we have been working very hard with editorial board and thanks to the board uh, center of expertise in Paris and Montreal for supporting uh, all the logistic things and writing the papers. Uh, we have four peers and uh, we start to say that we are contributing for the society, for the world, but more concretely, we are thinking about how we can uh, position with the uh, United Nations sustainable goals. It's something overlapping challenges. And we have already many of our working group working, tackling these issues. For us, priority will be responsible for environment in general, and also fostering human rights and gender, gender equality. And also we see, okay, in the health, because in particular in the Japanese context, we are aging society, and the health issue be very critical for the society, and some of, many of members' countries is something key that we have to improve in the health services. So AI for health and better living. And finally, AI for education. It's really um, overall issues and each of them is quite well linked to the SDGs. But not only just putting a label, but we have to foresee in a global way and then uh, trying to really capture our strength from a proposal to work on this issue, but with the action, actionable, operationable thinking. Um, we have some suggestion to member country to use all these ideas, books, as a kind of taking action, and we are recommending to take some concrete action, could be, and some of them are launching a series of grand challenges for responsible AI to have a more concrete ideas about that. Not just saying that we are taking action for UN SDGs. We are implementing AI strategy, but together, and something that you can formulate in terms of grand challenges. And also, in your members' country, you have many actors taking actions. Some of them already SDG oriented. But you need to have some uh, 
tools to assist and really have, you have to really uh, yeah, recommend them to develop some specific digital accountability tools for AI community. So it's really concrete uh, recommendation. Pillar two is really an um, invitation to change the way you set up governance structures. We are recommending to really adapting participatory governance tools that support inclusion in the communities impacted by AI system from design to development. It is life cycle approach and also Again, we see the multi-stakeholders approach and not really leaving these issues to specialists, uh, tech guys or experts or government officials. But basically, what it means is working together, working with multi-stakeholders. And it should be uh, as a prerequisite able to include all communities, not just waiting that some community will be complaining with the use of AI, but from the beginning to work together. So it is our philosophy to have this inclusion of communities. And the priority set by the MEG for GP works is basically we have free the sources of AI to be empowered is data. Data institutions focusing on community engagement. So we talk about biases and also we talk about uh, discriminations. But from to really adjust this kind of negative side of AI use, uh, we need to have from the beginning some community engagement. So addressing to data institution for that. And also regarding workplace, I mean, in the working party future of work, it's really uh, what we need, it's really for this uh, workplace issues, empowering and the engaging worker to participate to the discussion and really debate on AI. Also, we need to have AI should be not exclusive tools, but inclusive tools, enabling people to express their views and really capturing their views. So use of AI to support inclusion of the disabled or minorities again. So again, for the addressing to GPA's members, for that you have many institutions existing in place, but make them aware of this aspect to these existing institutions. So make strategic investment in new and existing institutions that starts and share data. So from the beginning, think about these issues. Um, also consider how they can ensure participation and co-determination in strong in enterprise regarding AI adoption, because it is at the level of enterprise to decide adapting AI, which type of AI. It is a decentralized decision making, but we have to take sh make sure that they are aware of these aspects and also inviting them to have more inclusive approach and uh, co-decision making approaches. It is not only for AI, but raising the question, the way you govern, you are running your companies and institutions, it's much powerful to have more participation and condition determination pushes. Pillar three, uh, helping steel emerging technical frontier so they align with the public interest and support the protection of human rights. This is interaction between AI user, AI implementation, and the society. From the beginning, we have to really think about, you have to protect and for the ensure human rights in any cases. And also think about the society, 
not only for your own sake, your profit of maximization, but you have to have a really huge impact on the society in the way that you have to take up on the public interest. So when you are working in emerging technology, really creating it's exciting and empowering your companies, but thinking about your society, but at the same time you have to take account of all these sometimes conflicting uh, interests and public interests and supporting human rights. So priority by the NEC uh, regarding, again, starting with the data. Data justice is something key, critical for now. And we do not know what could be the implication on the human rights on these things. So first, we have to start work on in a very uh, theoretical way again. So advancing research and practical practice on data justice. And also, uh, we have to write preserving technology because uh, as I said, baseline is protecting human rights. And sometimes you, you can have AI due to the biases introduced by data and other algorithm uh, reducing human rights. But instead, not just correcting these biases, we may enhance human rights power. So please working on this aspect. New foundational models is coming in. Uh, we have to talk about, and we don't know yet, it could be the main stream or not, but the reality is that it's happening. So from new model, from new theory, from the beginning, we have to think about societal implication. That's the recommendation. And also we need to test something because uh, sandboxes, it's really um, in place in many governments. But make sure that you are testing before scaling up and then having a look from the feedback coming from the reality, so the regulatory sandbox. And also we have to have framework and the methodological to operationalize AI ethics because so many debates on AI ethics, but it's still limited to the abstract level discussions. What we want to do is make it operational and really reflecting the reality. And also what is important to, to evaluate companies' commitment to ECD AI principle. We know that OECD is working on, but also we can complement mobilizing our experts at GPI, really bringing a new perspective. And also given that we'll be more focusing on uh, actionable action, so we have been, we can work complementary with the OECD. Again, for the GPA members, um, you have already in many countries regulations, uh, principles, and uh, regulatory issues, all the rights, data rights and justice. Um, we have to re really inviting them to not just focusing on some specific issues, but overall impact of these uh, regulations. And also inviting governments to really make some kind of experimentations, such as PTs and associated with new technology, and again with the foundational models. Again, we, we need to have some kind of experimentation in small scale and looking after the what could be impact within your countries and we're scaling up with them. Um, and also, again, in really uh, merits of ADA, former AI aviation framework industry guideline, uh, what so many now framework is existing. We have to really, to really check what's happening. The pillar four, now the last one, is a really broader access to the economic benefits of AI and data technology. It is not pre preserved for some category of the people. It should be open, approach its inclusiveness. And again, with the big priorities, um, we advise, advocate to promoting a right 
based approach on economic justice in data governance frameworks. This is already done in some countries, but we have to really encourage in moving in these directions. And in particular, um, when you are discussing about AI issues, mainly its counterparts are stakeholders in big companies. And uh, main drivers in your country is the SMEs. And then we have to help them to accelerate their adoption and really providing them advices and really what you know about the impact of AI, we have to share with SMEs and supporting them for IP issues and so on and so. And also really um, company to all sides to boost their research benefits of AI. And also what's really important is really uh, after taking actions and after several years, we have to evaluate. It's not easy because you, you can easily implement the AI, but what's the impact? It takes time and also you need to have some tools and also mobilize resources to evaluate. So we are uh, inviting them to do that. And again, for the GPS members, um, not only taking account of key stakeholders, but take citizen as a key stakeholder. So promote citizen awareness about potential of AI in, for example, the workplace and also their challenges, risk and benefits to have really in empowering citizen to be able to have a say. And also, again, fostering international and global exchanges or strategy. And this is happening and within the GPI, we are providing space for that. So please use GPI for empowering yourself and exchanging and also working with and also mobilizing exchanges with a professional student and so on and so. Um, please have a look on the SMEs because they have their own specific issues. And again, at the end, uh, what is key is empowering people and uh, more concretely, broadening training and development, development programs beyond not ordinary students, but more largely uh, including general public to understand AI. So that's it for my side. So I welcome your feedback, comments, and questions because it is our first baby. Baby should grow up. And next year, we have much more well-equipped annual report, but we have to start with something. So this is our first report. And thanks to all people contributing to this report to be ready in time, and Nicola and both um, Center of Expertise in Paris and Montreal supporting us, and also thanks to all of you, because it's your baby. Thank you. Thank you, Yuku. I'd like to check the room and, and look for any reactions to the messages that you've heard or in any specific parts of Yugo's presentation, any of the pillars, any of the recommendations, uh, just to you know get the conversation started. So for those in the room, there are people with uh, mics that can come to your place and those online, you can, you can pose the question on the uh, on the t on the on the actual chat, and uh, your question will be read, or you can direct directly talk to all of us. Do I have any any reaction to the messages as to the actions that we are proposing to take uh, for the experts and specialists in the next twelve months? Can I make an intervention? I'm online. Um, please let us know where you are, because it's hard to actually see anything with these beams of light on our faces. So my name is Bish Oh, thank I'm you so much. Thank you for, for joining online. Thank you. 
Thank you. You know, it was a wonderful presentation, particularly highlighting the four pillars of uh, GPA's uh, thinking. And, uh, you know, I, I very much uh, understand and uh, appreciate all the four pillars, in particular the fourth pillar, which relates to the economic benefits of AI and data technologies. And, uh, you know, all the other pillars are extremely important. But that said, um, you know, uh, in addition to congratulating the entire group that I put together and the presenter who made it so succinct and, uh, you know, easy for us to understand, um, you know, as a member of the Future of Work working group, it would be a pleasure for us to continue to discuss this in the working group sessions on how these four pillars can inform our work in terms of the future of work. So I'm looking forward to it. So I wanted to say this to just to congratulate the entire group that we put together and the center. Thank you. Thanks so much for your contribution. Do you have anything to add to this uh, intervention? Um, I just presented four pillars um, as uh, consolidated ideas coming from all working groups. Thanks to the all co-chairs participating to formulating this annual report. Now it's second step, next step will be coming back to getting back to the working groups. So it's really kind of iterative procedure. And now up to the working group to work on, look at this uh, consolidated ideas for peers. How in a working group you can focus on or some, because you can do everything. So we have to choose some specific issues and in your perspective, in the working group perspective, that's the key issues. So it's go and back. So it's up to you, not for us, <laughs> but you to discuss, to, to find your way. And uh, probably you can push your co-chair uh, to set up brainstorming meeting, something like that. Really uh, make link between annual reports and your work. And by doing that, we will be sure that members will capture our messages and picking up for the next year project. Or um, we, we take a bold view and we dare to advance what are the issues that we see emerging in the world. I mean, if you look at the pillars and they constantly remind people as to human rights, equal rights, why, why all this is because this is where you find the biggest breaches. I mean, social media has been a catastrophe. Facebook gets hacked four times a year, affecting hundreds of millions of people. It's only that the media doesn't cover this. Uh, Twitter is a circus right now. And governments need to start looking at the, the effect of these particular deployments of AI into their, into their actual citizenship. But if we then see what are the events that are gonna make AI completely catapult incredible change, you have to go back to future of work, industries, um, because sectors, approaches, because this is where you really see the impact. Um, the internet ran wild for 20 years almost without any government intervention. And what I think we should aim is that AI doesn't follow the same path of chaos, that we really take it for the power that it has. The internet is nothing compared to AI. AI is a force. The internet is a playground compared to AI. And I think that it's a huge responsibility that we have to really align our work, our advice, with what we believe governments should focus on. But at the same time, governments have a huge power of changing the future of things. I'll give you an example of the, one of the projects that I'm involved in. If agriculture is to be technified, 
every nation that I have studied that has supported AI and technical developments in agriculture has allowed governments to then create very quick practices, very quick regulations that force the adoption. For example, demanding specific data that proves that crops and anything that makes it into the food chain uh, of human consumption of, of food, you know, will not be affected. And that was thanks to regulation. So sometimes a government has a lot of power to actually make adoption happen, rather than expecting that things will happen by their own synergies, kind of like how we all got on the internet. It's not going to be like that. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, do, do you think that creating uh, specific roadmaps for adoption, which is what I have proposed based on many conversations that I have with different stakeholders, will be an activity that will accelerate our work in terms of really getting into very concrete actions, but also enhance the value of what we do? Road mapping is a really interesting exercise because you are gathering multi-stakeholders, thinking about, discussing about the futures. And it's a way Let's hope to set up some goals for the coming years and breaking down for some concrete actions. The danger is that once it is done, this exercise, People thinking about nothing about the discussions, but just taking picking up some sentences. Next year, I have to do one ABC. In the coming five years, I have to achieve ABC. And then at the end, we will have some result. But ordinarily, it's happened so many things around the world, and we have so many non countable parameters coming in, and then some hypotheses at the beginning not realized. So you should be able to adjust, adapt your roadmap. So all the full cycle is in place, it's fabulous tools, and even your final goal may be revised. So you have to have this capacity, flexibility to do that, Otherwise, you become very strict, and it's the danger for to not to be able to run deductions and uh, divert it from what you have to do. So these two aspects, and uh, I, I believe in the value of preparing road, ma road mapping, but much less the value of the final goal you set up at the beginning. It's something we have to work on. Yeah, I mean, do you think that uh, nations in development will be the ones that will benefit the most from AI or nations already developed? I have my own view on this. I just wanted to hear yeah, yours. Yeah, I would like to hear from your view. Uh, my personal view is that what is interesting with AI, it is not uh, based on something that you have to have already as an infrastructure or many things, but you can catch up. And then uh, it's enabling. But also, as we discuss about ethical issues or the human rights, all these things, and also we are discussing about data biases, uh, it's reflecting existing social structures. So what's this AI introductions and the planning of AI implementation in your country as a national strategy, it's not only from technological aspect, much more raising the question, questioning on the social values, social system you have in place, and it should be used in the right way to improve these social biases in a way to move in the better shaped and fair, fairer society. But if you are not able to think about all this full aspect, 
you can introduce, you can you may imply fire this existing biases. So be careful. Your view. So I like well to hear your view. My Please. view from what I see is that the smaller nations and nations in development, when they adopt AI and they actually deploy it in the right way that we're advising, they have a massive transformation. The effect is enormous and is going to create an interesting narrative for us to manage in the GPay, which is it's, it's a good data point to think about which are the countries that develop AI. Are they doing it the right way that we all believe should be done? But I think in the long run is which is the government that knows how to use it and deploy it in the best way? Because it's all about what AI creates and empowers, not so much that you become an AI na nation. It's about how you leverage from AI and empower all your industries, the way you run society, et cetera. It's gonna be who does it better rather than which are the nations that are developing algorithms. Uh, that's my view as someone who has developed algorithms and done it for real. You know, It's more about how you grow the value of your output and your place in the world as a nation by using tech and AI in the most optimal way. You don't need to develop AI, you just need to use it better. Um, do we have any uh, members, uh, any experts that would like to give, give us their feedback as to further ways in which we could not just enhance the value of your contribution, but perhaps um, facilitate these, these new goals that we have set for ourselves? Uh, thank you so much. Can someone pass a microphone to this gentleman on the first row? And if you could let us know of your name and, and, well, thank and you association. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Kropleski. Oh, Robert. It's me. I uh, can't it's see <laughs> you with my glasses on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, now it's two years uh, uh, work of in the GAPI week and be older. Uh, I understand because my eyes also, of course, not works good uh, after the online sessions. But uh, referring to this, uh, I uh, really touched uh, your expression, uh, Imma, because you uh, started um, to present a um, new uh, year of our working, and you said that it's something with teaching machine and learning from machine. That kind of cycle uh, for me uh, seems to very interesting if we talk about uh, education and maybe it's a challenge not to, s to think and consider how to adopt artificial intelligence but how to adopt ourselves to that kind of, not maybe evolution or revolution but that kind of meeting, everyday meeting uh, with uh, artificial intelligence as a medium, this is the thing. It's an interface, finally. It's a new medium of uh, communication between the people and and uh, machine at the same moment. And this is a question, this, uh, I think it's the mo most challenging uh, question, how we can educate ourselves in front of machine from the many aspects, human rights and even co commercialization. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, I think that the expert group at the GPA has a very privileged position to start controlling the AI narrative. Because when I go out in the world and sometimes I'm interviewed by journalists or I speak to CEOs, the amount of wrong information that they have in their heads as to what AI is, and it's all because the media doesn't really know how to explain it properly in the newspapers is really detrimental for, for the work that we do. And I think that we need to start um, you know, controlling the narrative from our perspective because I get really tired when constantly I'm being asked if robots are going to take people's jobs and robots like Sophia are going to be sitting next to us on the bus. I mean, these kind of fantasies that the media feeds really do no good for anyone. And I think that 
some of our work should be also on the side of controlling the narrative. Yes, robotic automated systems are very useful because they make no errors and they do things that humans really don't go and they don't do, but maybe humanoid robots are not the best thing for us in the world. Maybe I'd rather have a little Hello Kitty robot that is more entertaining, you know, not something that is going to alienate me next to me because it kind of looks like a human. So I think that one of the activities that we could have vis-a-vis -vis not just the members but the outside world and society is really defining what we think AI is, what it is not, and then start demystifying all these uh, futures that are pretty much fed from Hollywood films. You know, we need to take stake and, and to take hold of our industry and really start educating the world because unfortunately humans and people, whether they work for a government or they work in the private sector, they all read the same media. And then we need to start really defining things for what they are and what, what they should not never be. You go. If I may add, um, just I'm on the working party of future work. So my personal experience with my colleagues is that we have to start from the reality check. So that's why from the beginning, July, June 2020, the first action was collecting use cases. Implemented already in companies, in institutions, and to see what's happening in reality. And also we are proceeding to interviews by students. How do you think about it? And this is um, an asset from GPI to show outside that it's not science fiction and it's happening. And if we can do, we can we would like to better shape these experiences in the future and sharing these cases with all of us. And regarding education, it's really we have to adapt our contents of our education related to the advanced AI be in place in the education system. But also, it's right a question, the way we, we have to teach could be new way. And on the contents too, what's the key elements of education? Because we can get so many information through internet and uh, we selecting by AI, recommended by AI. But who you are, how you'll be thinking about, you have to develop new skills, new competencies. And we had to focus on, and that's opening a door for the new way of thinking about education. I mean, the, to me, AI in education is about empowering self-learning. Each student should feel capable of reviewing on their own and maybe setting up little challenges. It's not about this AI robot mm, face recognizing everybody in the classroom. You know, it's not that. Um, is there any other, yes, thank you. On the second row, thanks. Uh, hello, I'm Marco Grobelnik from Josef Stefan Institute. I guess here I can talk also for, uh, from the side of OECD AI Policy Observatory where I'm contributing. So one, there are several aspects to work, right? Uh, uh, AI and um, labor market. Uh, but one which I'm not sure if it was touched properly. Right? Um, uh, it's skill migration, right? Uh, if we observe, uh, okay, use LinkedIn data because this seems like the only reasonable resource. But uh, so AI is. Uh, talent, let's say, it's migrating from certain countries to other countries, massively. Yeah. And uh, this might cause also disruption on any kind of planning, right, uh, when talking about AI. Could you comment how you see this, uh, this aspect? I mean, there are many more aspects, right? Uh, 
uh, to uh, labor market and uh, AI. At the moment, we, we observe by all the indicators uh, that uh, there's no job loss because of AI yet, but uh, likely uh, we will reach point of saturation where the job loss eventually will happen. Then this might be in the next, I would guess, five to ten years. It's not like next year, but uh, in foreseeable future, right? So, uh, so, and then this will be probably pretty fast um, in different uh, industry sectors. So, <coughs> basically, two questions or uh, if you can could comment so skill migration which is reality this is not something which is not happening it is uh, not just from country to country but also from academia to industry right so the one of the hardest uh, type of uh, uh, people which <coughs> you can get uh, these days is postdoc right postdoc uh, at the university this is pure gold uh, and uh, this seems like it's affecting already academia, right? Uh, in Europe for sure and US, but also elsewhere, right? So academia to industry and country to country. Could you, could you maybe comment on this two uh, dimensional view to uh, skill migration? Um, you're talking to an entrepreneur, <laughs> a serial entrepreneur. Um, I think that postdocs and research are for very specific people that really that's their passion. And, and the ones that really feel the fire in their hearts to continue researching, they, they continue. But one of the things that we see today is that knowledge transfer is becoming something that finally is streamlined out of academia. Um, 15, 20 years ago, nobody understood how to do it. Um, universities used to sell IP to large corporations and make money from these sales. And the, and the IP was created by postdocs, yeah? But not everything is going to be black or white. You know, we need researchers because we need that type of deep, patient, you know, dedicated study and then we also need people that find solutions to problems that nobody is able to address. And we need those skills as well because the amount of complexity that we faced in this decade is like 10 times more than 20 years ago. And that's undeniable. The world is infinitely more complex today than it was in 1999. And we need all the brains that we can to apply themselves to a real world, not so much research. Um, am I concerned that the best students and the smartest people are leaving their nations and, and, and vacuuming you know, the pool potential uh, in their nations to just go to another market? It's been ongoing and for decades and it's a combination of not enough investment in their countries for creation of really proper jobs for these people or challenges that they feel I that they can remain. Um, I think it's decreasing, not increasing. Um, in my age, when the mobile internet emerged and it was mostly developed between Europe and Asia, not in the US, finally, when someone called Steve Jobs launched a phone in Palo Alto, the heads that moved across the Atlantic were all coming from Europe and Asia. We lost a lot of clever people so that they would build that industry over there. What we're aiming is, especially with our members, is that we will give them tools to retain the talent and create initiatives, whether they're academic or they're going straight into industry for their own nations, because we want people creating value for their own people not in foreign nations. I think that we're on the right path to achieve that because nobody used to speak about AI in Spain until very recently. And now, you know, the government has mobilized itself with a lot of initiatives, a lot of funding, 
and it's kind of you know something that is flourishing. So I'm hoping that that will be the same case study for other countries. Do you have anything to add? You go. Um, you ask in the question about skill immigration, migration. Um, but don't forget that behind skills you have human being. And this person may be gaining in terms of competencies and skills by moving from one place to another, one sector to another from academy industry or changing countries, gaining experiences. And the uh, skill set to be more broader. And then it is not for sure that they'll be staying there, may come back or change space again. And what's be interesting for you is really to be attractive for many talents. And they have to make effort in the way to be something that you can add um, in person, but at the same time in society. So it's really the challenges. You are not prohibiting people to go outside. But think about this person will be one way to gain the competencies, and it's up to you to we attract this person. So it's win win game should make in place and it's up to you again, not only for the just counting how many outgoing, how many coming in and the stuff. It's it's really dynamics. And you have to look after not just the short term but mid term and long term. I have a one question from online. Yeah, just to uh, complete it. Some jobs from sectors that are like in decline will definitely disappear because it's the law of nature. But there are sectors that are on the growth, such as healthcare, agriculture, where actually the amount of work and jobs that will emerge because of the transformation in these industries will, will be unparalleled. Um, will radiologists lose their jobs? No, they'll have better tools to actually do their job. So there's going to be a balance from sectors that will be increased in terms of labor force thanks to AI and others that will suffer transformation on the decline. We have an online question. So I'm Hemant Darbari. I'm part of the innovation and commercialization uh, group and uh, I'm from CDAC India. Two things uh, which have happened. One, that this panel was very, very uh, effectively bringing out the future requirements of the AI and how AI should work. But what we have done is that we have all worked towards how to accelerate the innovation to commercialization process. This is very, very interesting that now academia and academic research is moving to the industry and industrial products and solutions are moving to the common man. So I think I have a very good feeling that all of us put together can create a world where AI is only used for the benefit of the society. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Uh, it's good to have this feedback, you know. Um, I think that our effort is trying to uh, ensure that our work is very, very clear that it's about manifesting AI in the world, helping AI being deployed and adopted, not just understood by our members. We are not policy makers. This is what we are not but we are definitely scientists and experts and people who have built AI, deployed AI, understand the intricacy of AI, and this is the knowledge that we offer. Um, do I have any further questions or comments from the floor or online that we can, yeah, there is one here. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Michael Sullivan from uh, New Zealand, and I really agree with your comments on healthcare and AI for healthcare, but the big issue that I've had 
with AI and healthcare is the change management. So convincing people to be able to adopt the artificial intelligence, which is proving successful research. I'll be interested to hear your comments on that. So healthcare is a field that I have worked and I have encountered quite interesting effects. Um, 50 years ago, if you had a cardiopathy, there were five super heart surgeons in the world. The older people in the room will remember the famous South African heart surgeon. And it's because when you have cardiopathies, they need to perform incisions in your heart muscle that are millimetric. Not one centimeter, but millimetric which meant that if you were not lucky to have a super surgeon performing surgery on you, you would be given pharmaceutical products. Sintron, anyone? Half of the population is taking that. Now, when robotic surgery began to be deployed, it meant that less skilled surgeons with the use of an interface performed by a robot were able to perform the same super precision surgeries. Therefore, more lives were saved. And what we see in image detection, for example, in medicine, is that right now the population goes and has CT scans, MRIs, that then a human being interprets. And very, very little companies like Fujifilm Siemens, Siemens, who are the leaders in this type of image photography, are building AI within those machines to help the radiologists see what a human eye cannot see anymore. Therefore, more lives will be saved. When I said earlier that we need to control the narrative, it's because we need to start sending these messages out. The messages of experts and people that really know about these, not journalists that cover a sector for an article in a paper. And there is more evidence of the actual transformation in a beneficial way that AI deploys rather than negative horror stories that the press puts out there. Um, in the very near future, anyone will want a super precision machine that can see what nobody sees to tell you if you have a tumor. Because your human doctor cannot see that tumor, but the machine can see it. And therefore, you will be prescribed preventative medicine, preventative therapies that will save your life because it was tackled very early on. This is the medicine of the future. So I have huge hopes rather than negative visions of these. We had a question here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> See, my question was broadly related to democratization of AI. See, if you look at internet, you made several reference in comparing with the effect that internet had. Internet did have, it was more of an access technology and all of us could make use of it, participate. Uh, will AI also be a democratic technology or will it be that there'll be a few houses or few organizations which will have control over algorithms and we will all be subjected to those algorithms? What are your thoughts on that? So right now, the last time I checked the AI algo libraries, there's about 187 200 algorithms that are classified, they have names, I know what they're for, which algos are complementary to them. So, and, they, and the open source community on GitHub has already trained algorithms that you can just literally copy and paste. So access to mathematical algorithms is super standard and it's very, very open. Now, where is the skill? The skill is in training those algorithms for specific purposes with specific data sets. And that is the mastery of the people behind it, which is why one of our projects is, could we consider a form of intellectual property so that it becomes an asset within a corporation and it has a P&L value, yeah? But I don't see 
some mega corporation, privately owned, locking up access to established algorithms and then preventing people to have access to them because, because they want to charge you for it. Uh, that never went right in the music industry, in the rights world, you know, putting, putting walls to the ocean, the water always finds its way. That's my motto. And I think that our role, and it's an excellent question, because these are the questions that fly in people's heads, honestly, is that we then know how to explain it or how to create a scenario planning, which is also another thought I had for our expert group. Scenario planning is a phenomenal discipline that shows the power of AI, but also contributes to super strategic optimization. And many of our members may come to us and say, this is our nation, X number of millions of people. This is our budget for AI initiatives. What can we really do with this? And we can just do a scenario plan and modeling for them and, and prioritize. Well, maybe you should start with this. Maybe data governance is the first thing you should. So the possibilities of what we can do here in combination are endless. And I thank you for that question because this is a real question. This is the question that a CEO asks you. And you have to be prepared to have a logical answer, an experienced answer based on facts. And this is what we have here with all of our work combined. No one better than us to answer these. That's why we, we need to, um, and it's my mission to, to bring the value of the experts to the steering committee for what it is, but also for what it could be if used in a smarter way. Yes, please, there's a question on the first row. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jose Guanchijo uh, from Brazil, Minister of Science, Technology, and Innovation. Um, it's amazing what has been achieved and all that you say to us. Um, but as a public policymaker, I, I, I'm missing one specific aspect. Uh, okay, you achieve a lot of things. Everyone know here that AI is great and so on. But what are the challenge issues when you work on these projects? What are the gaps where you have to take a round because there is a regulation, there is some problem that you have that. I really miss in the reports some specific chapter saying, oh, when we're doing that, we find this problem, we, uh, we, we need that as government to understand the real problem in a specific case and go inside in our office and decide what we should or shouldn't do. Uh, if you have that, uh, it will be very useful for us. Thank you. Obrigada pela sua uh, pergunta. Uh, super question. I, uh, now this is getting interesting, right? You're so right. And it's easy for us to actually build that information into our work because our daily work is encountering those challenges and barriers and trying to get around them. Uh, so I'm taking notes and definitely this is something that I think we would look into because it's actionable. It's a real demand. I need you to tell me what barriers you encounter so that maybe we as policymakers can lift them up. T note it, note it, and you shall have it. <laughs> if I may. Yes, you could, please go ahead. Because our report is bringing our voices. Now, up to the government's members to give us the feedback. It is not so clear for us to be actionable. We want to focus on some sector specifically or others. For that, we need to have this interaction in the way that we can customize our recommendations or focus on some specific issues. But for that, we need to know each other much better than today. So it will be the next year challenges. 
I'll give you an example that I'm working on uh, in the EU. Um, digital profiling. So on the one hand, you have the European market wanting a government-driven and led ID online based on the one time only. If I am your government and I give you your passport, I'm the only entity in this world that you tell me your date of birth, your names, and where were you born, etc., etc. And I hold that information because that is your key in the blockchain, yeah? Therefore, you should not share passport data with gimmickycompany.com that is going to allow you to talk to other people in a social media. So therefore, the future regulation should be these companies, the only thing they need to know is are you over 18 and it's a box and you do not need to give them passport data. That would be a lovely regulation. And this is just an example. There's so much in this big data puzzle that we need to cut and throw away and do in a different way, much better, more control, safer for people. I am obsessed with cybersecurity. So this is an example, how things should be so that governments are in a much more controlling position to protect their citizens and yet allow them to enjoy as many mobile apps as they want to download on their phones, but their data now is handled differently. It's all about regulation in place. Uh, so I'm, uh, my promise to you is, yes, you shall have that information for next year's reports. Yes, online question now. Okay. Do we have a question on the floor in the meantime? Robert, again. It's uh, not, not a question, but a uh, reaction and comments for your question. Thank you for, for very much, and thank you for your reaction. That is a challenge for a new year, uh, maybe the most uh, important question for our work. But I think that maybe I try to answer very shortly. I think that we couldn't find and we don't find one answer because this is a complex issue, yes. This is a, this is a hybrid elements, how to deal with governance, with many gaps, many risks, and benefits, needs of benefits, yes, and use artificial intelligence uh, for that or, or oppositely. But maybe it's a, a other challenge, because of your question. Let's start shift information society paradigm for knowledge society paradigm, new paradigm, how to develop that way. And finally, you, and you can enrich, enrich your citizens, like in my country, we can, maybe we can learn how to govern the knowledge of people, the creativity of, of people, and finally of trust. Maybe this way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I always say that the future is not about intelligence, it's about cognition. It's not just good enough to know about things, it's to know what to do about those things. That's the real, the real thing to, to achieve. Is the online question uh, coming in? Yes, okay. Okay, well I guess it's not coming. Um, I think we are gonna bring this to a close. Anyone else wants to um, mention anything? Um, and by all means, you know, if there's anything else in your head uh, and we're here tomorrow, we're all flying around the building, we can have one-to-ones. So just to uh, close the discussion, I think that um, we're entering a new dimension for the uh, member of experts group. Um, we, we know that the quality of these experts is second to none, but also the uniqueness of their combined knowledge is just irreplicable. And what we see the expert group delivering is 
very concrete information, very specific routes to actually now take those projects and make them a reality and ease the way of adoption for the member countries. So with that target in mind, um, I thank all of the experts and specialists for their incredible contribution. It's so much work jumping on those Zoom calls at punishing hours. I'm talking about our lovely colleagues from Japan. Thank you, guys. You always take the stiff end of uh, everything, either it's super early or very late into your night. I'm so grateful, um, and I'm very hopeful that we will continue to achieve higher and higher goals for the GPA, which should be an organization with a very well-established place in the world because it's super needed. Thank you, everyone. I bring the session to a close now. Thank you.